Morning, how we doing? Good, good. Let's open our Bibles together uh, to the book of Psalms. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the chair in front of you. Used to be a pew, not anymore. As you're turning, I was interested to find out this week uh, that Psalm 130, we're going to be working through today, is one of what in Christian tradition has been known as the penitential psalms. Try to say that five times fast. Um, and those, there's seven of them, as we thought about it as a church over time. Psalm 6, 32, 38, 51, 102. Uh, oh, man, I'm going to forget that one. Is it 130 and then 142, I believe. There's seven. I don't know if I just gave you seven or six, but I tried to remember them. There's seven that we've thought of as kind of confessional psalms. We're very familiar with Psalm 51, yes? So that's an example. Psalm 32 also is very, blessed is the man who who, uh, confesses his sins. So it holds a special place in Christian tradition. It's, It's one of the more famous psalms of ascent as we're moving through 120 through 135. Um... So let's read it together. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's pray together. Father, We come before you guilty, guilty, Lord, for not caring enough about the salvation, the redemption of those around us. Lord, many things hold us back, fear of man, um, fear of losing our reputation, fear of response that we might get, maybe consequences in a workplace, but we don't want to be unwise, but we, we are not as bold and courageous. We don't think in terms of the next life. We think in terms of this life, and we ask your forgiveness for our, our lack of care for those around us who are going to hell, the coldness of our hearts, our indifference our prizing of our own comfort. We ask your forgiveness. And we believe that we have it in the name of Jesus Christ. Because, Lord Jesus, you proclaimed the gospel perfectly. You lived it perfectly in word and in deed. Lord, you were the very image of God. Lord, when... Those who lived in your day saw you and heard you. It was truly hearing and seeing the Father. You represented the Father perfectly. And that shining righteousness is now ours through faith. And we thank you for it in our failures. We thank you for your death. Lord, dying for the idol of our comfort to bring salvation to the world. Thank you for caring more than we do. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would help us to grow, help us to look with compassion on those around us, even those who might come to church and call themselves Christians but don't have a living relationship with you, Lord, that we would be bold, that we would be courageous, that we would lay it on the line with wisdom, with thoughtfulness, with care, with gentleness, Lord, not browbeating not domineering, not being harsh, but that we would speak. How can we not speak 
of what we have seen and heard, how can we not speak of what you have done in our lives? For as we sang this morning, Holy Spirit, our life is not our own. We were bought with a price. So may we glorify you as living sacrifices in this dark world. Holy Spirit, give us the power. Give us the spiritual energy. Give us the words. That, uh, help us not to worry about the words that we're going to speak, but that you will provide them in the moment that we need them. Lord, as we think about our community, uh, I pray for our brother Ted Fazer and Marietta. Uh, Ted's preaching this morning at Presbyterian Church. We just pray you'd clothe him with power to bring the gospel to that church. Thank you for their ministry in our community. Thank you for um, the privilege it is for us, in a sense, to, to send them into that. Uh, but we pray it would be fruitful in your hand. And Lord, now as we turn our attention to your word, we ask for not just words, but a demonstration of your power, that you would meet us just where we need to be met, and you would open our hearts to hear what you have to say as an act of worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this particular psalm is about the experience of sin and redemption. Sin and redemption. It's interesting, isn't it, that something so weighty, so important as sin and redemption, God would choose to speak to us through poetry. Through poetry. Lots of great prose on the subject. Matt led a, real, a little slice today. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, Romans. I mean, there's so much. When we talk about sin and redemption, so much good prose, and we're more familiar with that. We're probably more comfortable with that, of just that straightforward style, that straightforward language. But in fact, this is not the only way that God speaks, even I would say the main way that God speaks. What is the biggest book in the Bible? Psalms. Just rich in poetry, rich in imagery, rich in artistic flourishes. And you know, um, God is a poet. God is an artist. Is that how you think of him? I mean, he's a lot of things. I think there's different images and, and realities that we can get attached to and we can really you know, God is the, the, Jesus as the mighty warrior coming with the flaming sword. You know, maybe the guy's like that, and, and, and I don't know, you, whatever it is for you, there's a lot, tender friend, gentle and lowly, um, shepherd, a lot in the Bible to help us understand who Jesus is, who God is, but we have to remember that he's an artist, the original artist, the one who writes the world, who reveals himself truly, but catch it, indirectly. Indirectly. Poetry is indirect speech, and God likes it because there's a lot of it in the Bible. Even outside of the Psalms, prophets, Job, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, parables, and teaching of Jesus, all revealing truth indirectly through poetry, images, allegory. You know, people had a hard time with Jesus speaking in figures of speech because they just wanted to know, what's the law? What's the law? What do I got to do, Jesus? Just tell me, what can I do and what can I not do? That's what I want to know. So you keep speaking in these figures of speech, and I don't like it because I just, just be straightforward, just be direct. And the problem with that is that they wanted to know the law, more than they wanted to know God. Is that how you think of Christianity? Is that how you think of God? Basically just, you know, a disciplinarian. Tells you what you can do, tells you what you can't do. If that's the case, that's a problem. Or if you think of Christianity that way, that's not Christianity. It's a relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. And if you really want to know him, you've got to get familiar. You've got to get comfortable with poetry, with indirect speech. You know, Jesus is offering a lot when he talks like this. 
in the Gospels. He's offering access not only to himself, but to the Father. But indirectly, you must be born again. What? How, how does it? What? I am the bread of life. Excuse me? You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want eternal life. I'm sorry, what did you just say? I don't get it. Okay, could you just like tell me, get, get to the, the nugget here, like get to the black and white? What are you saying? But indirect speech like that, it reveals and it conceals. It reveals to those seeking the kingdom and it conceals to those who really are not seeking. They just want to know, what do I have to do to get God on my side? What kind of prayers do I need to pray to, you know, get some success? If you want to know God, this kind of language, it's a garden of revelation. It's a flower opening in the sun, revealing the very heart of God. But if you're not really interested in knowing God and you just, just you know, give me what I need, this will be wax in your ears and mud in your eyes. You will be deaf and blind. Truth will be concealed from you based upon your heart posture as you approach it. So, Psalms, you can't rush them, folks. You can't rush them. It's not an app. It's not a drive through It's tea. You have to let it steep. You have to let it breathe. Soak in it. Taste, smell, feel the poetry before you analyze it. Some of you are analytical, okay? Engineers, I'm talking to you. You can't just go in and analyze. We have to break it down. We've got to get this means this and this and sentence structure and... Mm. We have to feel it. Engage your emotions. Picture the images before you dissect them. A watchman waiting for the morning. What is that like? What does that feel like? To sit waiting for the, the morning and be watching, protecting, guarding. You have to picture that. Your imagination is the engine for understanding. We talked about it in Revelation. You have to be able to picture these things. That's why they're given. That's how you understand. So in a very real sense, in order to know God, you have to become like a child. What do children love? Nursery rhymes. They love poetry. They love rhyming. Even the really dark ones like Ring Around the Rosie. That's dark. See, we're all going to die and turn into dust. It's, sing it again. Okay, this is weird. They love it. Sing it again, Dad. Please, Dad. You, we sing lullabies. This is poetry. Before we rush to theological categories, and there are a lot in Psalm 130, there are tons in the Psalms, we've got to slow down and contemplate deeply. Contemplate feeling distant from God because of your sin. Has anybody ever felt that? Uh, of crying out to him, wrestling with him, wondering, is he really hearing me? Is he going to answer me? How long does it take? And then finally finding him to be merciful and forgiving. We have to slow down and feel that before we analyze and say, yeah, I got the truth. No, you don't. If you didn't feel it. And for some of you, you read this psalm, it doesn't feel super relevant to you right now. That's okay. That's great. If you're walking with the Lord, you're feeling good, wonderful. Let it be an encouragement to you. But some of you need this right now. <laughs> some of you, this is going to help you process your past. And for some of you, there are moments and seasons coming when you will feel like this. I am drowning. I don't know what to do. I can't fix it. I blew it. I don't see a way out. 
And I pray that this lodges deep in your heart for those moments. So you remember who God is when you come into them. Two big ideas, I think, summarize the psalm. Number one, sin is not final. And number two, God's mercy is final. Sin is not final. God's mercy is final. So the the psalm is not mainly here to beat you over the head that you're a big, fat, sinner, awful, terrible, wicked. True. But it's not here to tell you that. It's here to tell you that sin is not final. God's mercy is final. It's very hopeful. Okay, verse 1. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. He's yelling. This is a yell. From the bottom of the pit, Lord, help me. Drowning in the ocean, do you hear me? In fact, this, this phrase, this word, depths, is used typically in the Old Testament to say depths of the sea. That's the image. I'm drowning in the ocean of my sin and its consequences. And Lord, do you hear me? I'm calling to you. We know from verse 3 that this is not mainly about suffering. This is about sin. This is not just hard things coming into your life. There are many psalms about that. This is mainly about I have sinned and I am sitting and experiencing the consequences. We don't know exactly what happened, but it's the feeling of I blew it. I can't get out of front, front of this. I can't fix it. I've tried everything, and it's not working. I'm buried. I feel buried. My junior year of high school, um, the South Point Lancers, that was my team, the Lancers, were playing the uh, Amphi Panthers at Amphi for the 5A basketball Southern Arizona championship. Felt like a big deal at the time. Uh, it was a great game, uh, really close down to the end, and they missed the shot to win the game. We win the game, and we're going crazy, and I'm running off the court, and I did like one of those big, you know, chest bumps in the air with one of my teammates, and we're mobbing each other. The team's all mobbing each other. We fall down. Hundreds of people are pouring out of the crowd, out of the stands, jumping on top of us. I'm at the bottom. One of the scariest moments of my life. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I couldn't really even talk. All I could do was breathe out. pinching people, you know, as much as I could move my arm. That's how the psalmist feels. He's buried. He feels trapped. And all he can do, and sometimes all you can do, is breathe out just the faintest gasp of faith. you. I don't know if anybody heard me, but praise God, they got off. We lived. Maybe you've been unfaithful to your spouse in some way. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Maybe you've hurt your kids in a significant way. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Maybe you've been in conflict in a relationship and you haven't reconciled and you haven't owned your peace. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Maybe you have a sin pattern that is unrepentant or just you can't break it. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. And here's what you need to know. Whatever self-made pit you find yourself in, there is a rope. There is a way out. 
not because of your ability to climb, but because of who is holding the other end of that rope. You can trust him. You can believe that he's not going to let go. Verse 2. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. (coughs) Let me say this. I wasn't sure anybody heard me at the bottom of the pile, but you can be very sure that God hears you. Why? Because you have a great high priest who stands at the heavenly altar and is standing there now. And every time that you pray, he takes your prayers, hears them, perfects them, and takes them to the ear of the Father himself. That's what happens when you pray. Do you think God is not going to listen to his own son when he brings him your prayer? The Holy Spirit intercedes for you in your heart. We don't know how to pray. He helps us pray on this end of things. And then they go to Jesus Christ who never ceases to make intercession for you. He takes them, perfects them, and brings them to the Father. You don't think he's listening to his son. You don't think he hears your prayer. He does. He does. Every one. And if you don't believe that, let me challenge you, you are doubting the work of Christ. I know it's hard, especially when we're praying, praying, praying. It doesn't feel like anything's happening. But he hears you, and if you don't believe it, you don't believe the veil was torn. You don't believe that Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and sat down. You don't believe that he is interceding for you constantly. You don't believe what he did was enough. I know it's difficult, it's challenging to believe that, but let me just tell you, that's the truth of what you're saying when you don't. We doubt that God hears our prayers. It's doubting the very new covenant. So pray Psalm 130. Pray it like this. Ask God to hear your prayer. Lord, are you hearing me? But as you do, believe that you already have the thing that you ask for because of Jesus. Pray like this, but believe it even as you're praying it. Not like, eh, I hope he does. No, he does. And that's why I'm praying. Verse 3, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Do you see the repetition of O Lord? I can't talk about that on time, but it's like, O Lord, O Lord, O Lord, O Lord, covenant name. And this is not someone fighting with God. This is someone humbled before God. If you really marked everything that I've done wrong, Lord, could I stand in your presence? No. No, I couldn't. I would be incinerated. So when you feel trapped by your sin, which we all do at times, we feel stuck, how do you respond? Where do you go? Here's what won't work. Telling yourself you're a good person. Telling yourself you're, you're, you're really, you know, justifying your sin by thinking of all the good, well, you know what, I've done this, and I've done that, haven't I? I mean, really. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I'm not perfect, but... I get so frustrated with this in movies when I see it. It's like, I feel like it's, I probably would stand up and clap if it didn't happen, like in the theater. But someone is finally confessing what they've done. They're finally realizing, I am the problem. They're confessing it to a friend. And what do they say? No, 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 you're not that bad. You're a good person. You're talented. You're smart. You're funny. It's, you, you, you've done so many good things. Like, you're too hard on yourself. Like, ah! Well, how do I, how do I, you know, how could I ever be forgiven for the things that I've done? What do they say? You have to start by forgiving yourself. Just the worst thing you could say. I want him to say, yes, you're right. You, you nailed it. You're the problem. But guess what? There's good news because your creator, the one you're actually accountable to, is rich in mercy. He loves you. And you know that because he sent his only son to die for the sins that you committed. Isn't that good news? You can be forgiven because of Jesus Christ. Please. 
Guys, don't we have a better answer than the culture? Don't we have something better to say? Oh my goodness, please forgive yourself? How do I have any power to forgive myself? I have sinned against God and against others, but I'm the one who has to forgive me? It doesn't make any sense. And down deep, people know that. They know that. It doesn't work. And we, we have the truth. We have reality. Not like, yeah, you're bad and try to be better. No, real hope. Real hope in a real person, a historical person who died for you in your place. That's amazing. You can do all the self-talk you want, but your guilt will remain. Down deep, you have no power to forgive yourself. You can justify your choices. You can loosen the moral rules. You can try to change the rules completely, and we sure are trying these days. Just change the rules to make everyone feel better about what they're doing. But you can't remove the guilt. You can't remove the shame that people know down deep. They are not who they are supposed to be. Something is wrong with me. You can't make that go away by saying you're a good person. They know. They know. They're not. It's all a lie. Young people, it's a lie. Be warned. You're going to hear it over and over and over again. It's a lie. There's only one person who defines right and wrong, only one person who defines reality, and that is God. Not your parents in the end, not your friends, not culture. And the psalmist recognizes the only standard that matters is the divine standard, and so he's coming to God turns to the God whom he has failed, believing that his sin is not final. God's mercy is final. God's mercy is final. Verse 4. But with you there is forgiveness. How sweet are those words. I mean, we could just stop. But with you there is forgiveness. that you may be feared. Notice it's not merely you choose to forgive or you do forgive. It is with you, in you, is forgiveness. It's who you are, God. Yeah, God has the only authority to forgive sin, but he also has the disposition to forgive sin. Just as important, if not more important. It's not just what he does, it's who he is. Tracking with that? Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 34. Chop, chop. Exodus 34, verse 6. You remember in chapter 33, Moses has asked God, please show me your glory. Bold request. And what does God say? I will make my goodness pass before you. So it's interesting Glory equals goodness. I want to see your glory. Okay, I'll show you my goodness. That's interesting. And we get here in Exodus 34, 6, maybe one of the top three moments in all the Bible of divine revelation. I mean, the incarnation, we would say, is, is number one. And this can't be far behind it. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. That is holy ground. Notice the order first. In his own words, who is the Lord? Merciful and gracious. 
Is he just? Yeah. Does he get angry with sin? Yeah. But his anger has to be provoked. His mercy does not. Anger is not natural to God, we could say. It's strange to him. It's not his, like, normal state of being. He's not just angry all the time. But he is merciful all the time. That is natural to him. His anger is slow, like the airport security line at JFK in New York on Christmas Eve. Really slow. You got you to gotta wait. You better get there early. You're going to make God angry, it's going to take a while, okay? Literally, in the Hebrew, it's a, it's a long nose. His nose is long when it comes to anger. But with mercy, it's a reflex. It's like when you send an email to someone and you get an out-of-office reply, like, boom, right back. That's like God's mercy. It's just a reflex. Doctor hits your knee with one of those weird triangle thingies and it just pops up. That's God's mercy. It's not slow. It's not long. It's, it's immediate. Boom. You need mercy? Boom. That's his instinct. That's his reflex. Something else people miss here. How many generations will God visit generational sin on? Three? Four at the max? When we get hung up here, it's like, man, he sounds angry. It's like, wow, why do you have to be so hard on everybody? How many generations will he be merciful to? Let me hear it. Thousands. Not a lot of balance in that comparison, is there? Not a one-to-one. Mercy. Thousands of generations. Sin. Three to four. You want to know who God is? There it is. Not a lot of balance. And he's okay with that. He doesn't feel the need to say, and, and also thousands to the sin. And, no, thousand of mercy, three to four. And that's the whole Bible, guys, is like that. So much mercy, so much grace far exceeding any punishment. When you think about God, what are the first two words that come into your mind? I want you to think about that this week. It, it may be the most important thing about you. What comes into your mind when you think about God? Two words, what are they? Honestly, that will reveal a lot. Ask your kids. Just, you have to pick two words. What would you say? You'll learn a lot. Is it um, tolerant and complacent? Disappointed and frustrated? Is it exacting and precise? Stringent and demanding? How about merciful and gracious? How about gentle and lowly? Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, proved Exodus 34 is true. He did not come to judge the world, but to save it. Full of grace and truth, his heart was gentle and lowly. Boy, it's hard for us to believe that. You know, I think Satan is less concerned about getting you to commit individual sins and more concerned about getting you to believe that God is not gracious. You know, you dabble in this, you dabble in that, you have a little sin here and there, but you come back, Psalm 130, to the Lord, and you believe His redemption is plentiful. I think He knows He's losing. But He gets you to believe that this isn't true, that Exodus 34 isn't true, that Jesus did not come to seek and save the lost, but to point His finger at the bad. And He wins. How do you think of God? It's so important. And let me tell you, when you're in the depths, you will only grab the rope if you believe he's good. If you believe the person holding the rope on the other side is good. Otherwise, what's the point? 
why fight? Why struggle? Why cry out? If he's not merciful, you're wasting your time. And why does God reveal this merciful character to us? I'm glad you asked. That he may be feared. I expected it to say, that you may be forgiven. Why does God forgive? Well, so I can be forgiven. That's how I would write it. That's how I would think of it. No, not about us in the end. It's about God being feared. What does that mean? Well, that you would know him. Love Him, revere Him, enjoy Him, admire the glory of His goodness. So He he invites you into His very heart, into the inner circle of the Trinity through His forgiveness in Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis explains the idea that God demands praise. Ever thought about that? He explains it this way. That admiration is the correct, adequate, or appropriate response to it. God is that object to admire, which is simply to be awake, to have entered the real world. Not to appreciate Him is to have lost the greatest experience, and in the end, to have lost all. The duty exists for the delight. And what's it like not to know the God of mercy? He goes on. The incomplete and crippled lives of those who are tone deaf have never been in love never known true friendship, never cared for a good book, never enjoyed the feeling of the morning air on their cheeks, and never, I am one of these, enjoyed football, he means soccer, are faint images of it. In other words, if you haven't known this forgiving, merciful God, it's as if you've never felt love. You've never had a true friend. You've never felt the morning air on your face. You've never seen a beautiful sunset. And it's worse than that. Because he is the greatest gift. So much better than any of those things. And so I would just say, if you don't know Jesus Christ, here's the bottom line. You are missing out on life. Everything that you love, everything that you enjoy, guess where it comes from? Don't you want to know that person? And feel, feel the truth of your forgiveness. God commands you to trust Him. He commands you. It's, a, it's, a, it's not just an invitation, it's a command. Obey the gospel. Obey the gospel. Why does he do that? To invite you to enjoy him. Why does God call us to worship every Sunday? Because that's just what we got to do. He's inviting us to enjoy him. Is that how we think of it? Verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. So my takeaway here is that coming out of the depths is a process. It's a process, usually slower than we would like. And remember that in the lives of people where you're like, can you speed this up, God? Can we move a little faster here? Like put it into second gear. No. It's not an accident. It's it's intentional. This is God's way. He moves slow. In that process, he wants you to become a watchman as you wait, whether it's in the life of someone else or in your own life. In ancient cities, guards were stationed at the gates or on the towers to watch over the city during the night. That was their job. They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't do much. They couldn't control much. They just kind of sat there and watched, were alert, paying attention. And there's only one thing that they could know for sure, and that is the morning is coming. 
the morning will come. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. In the darkness, you can be sure God's mercy is coming, just like the morning. Every day it comes. You're waiting. And any of you who have dealt with insomnia, and I have, this is a great comfort. The morning will come. It will be over. <laughs> mercy is coming because I, I am losing it. Will you trust that? That in your waiting, when, you, when you're in the darkness, that there, God has sent a ship loaded with mercy and it's crossing the sea and it's going to come into port at just the right time at just, with just the right thing that you need. And we look back and we see that, don't we? Like I didn't see it at the time, but then now I look back like, oh, that's a little bit of what he was doing in making me wait. I wish I would have just watched with more faith. I feel that all the time. What, what does the mercy look like? It might be just the end of a trial. It might be a softened heart. It might be an act of kindness from someone. It might be freedom from an addiction. Whatever it is, God is sending it to arrive just in time. So guard your heart, brothers and sisters, against cynicism. Oh, it's deadly. Oh, it's poisonous. Really? I just can't see it. I don't know. I prayed and prayed. I've tried everything. I don't know what I don't know what God's doing, but I'm ready to give up. It's not going to happen. I know it's not going to happen. That is not faith. That is not believing this text. More than a watchman. More than a watchman knows the morning is coming, we can know that God's mercy is coming. We don't know when, we don't know how, but we know like the morning is coming, yes, and I'm watching for it. I'm expectant. That's how God wants us to live, with expectancy. Not doubt. And it's hard. But it pleases Him. And it's true. Verse 7. Notice the language shift to the plural. Psalmist turns to his people. I turns to we. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he, NIV translates it, he himself, which is helpful, he himself will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And we know that he did in Jesus Christ. But I want you to see how the eye turns to we. The eye turns to we. If you want more faith, hope, and love in your life, the church is of utmost importance. It's not just about you. And if you're, you're alone just kind of doing your Christian thing, you are missing out. It's we. It's we. I, I mean, here's the deal. Uh, by nature, you're sick. You need to be in a hospital to get healthy. It's the church. By nature, you're weak. You need to get in the gym and get stronger. It's the church. By nature, you're stupid. Some of you more than others. You're stupid. By nature, sin makes us stupid. And so we need to get in the classroom and learn. It's the church. By nature, you're isolated. You're, you're hard on yourself. And we need to be adopted into a loving family, the church. So some of you and some in our community resist that. Keep the church at arm's length, whatever your reasons. I'm sure you have reasons. But you, you keep the church at arm's length. And I just want you to examine that. Think about that. If those are people you know, have you lovingly, graciously challenged them? Not because you just want them to do the right thing, but because you want the best for them. This is the best. Some of you know that. You're experiencing life together as we. We are pulling in the same direction. We have a shared hope. It's so encouraging. I can't imagine living life without you guys. I can't imagine doing it alone. How awful. And we all did. 
for a time. Do you remember that, what that was like? I mean, so much better to be a we, to be together. I, I, I have grown so much just simply because of the church. Simply because of you guys being in my life. Simply because of other Christians and other places being in my life. Forget, you know, reading my Bible, my own prayer time, all those personal things. Like, yes, absolutely. I mean, when a baby is born, are they alone? Yeah, okay, home birth, yeah. You're in the hospital with the other babies. You're surrounded by people, even at home. You're surrounded by people. When someone becomes a Christian and they're a new baby in Christ, well, they need people around them to help them grow and be healthy and learn and talk and walk and all those things. We need people, guys. And I love the Psalms because they're the, the, the corporate element the dynamic of it's not just me and God, as personal as that is, it's we. It's we. So wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, there's hope because someone's holding the rope on the other side who you can trust and is good and wise and gracious. Remember that. Let's pray. Father, um, our sins are many. Some maybe need to be convicted of that this week. I've been a little bit indifferent, have not repented and made a practice of repentance. But also, Lord, we are so thankful that your mercy is more. That you throw them into a sea without bottom or shore. You choose not to remember them anymore because they have been fully paid in our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us sing in response to that great truth, the greatest of all truths, let us sing with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength now. In your name we ask. Amen. Well, it is our